Good morning. Welcome to worship. We are grateful that you are here. And for those of us who will be gathering online throughout this week, we're grateful that you are gathering with us as well. Just a couple of announcements before we begin our worship today. One, just a reminder, as we know, um, but also just to make sure that we keep getting the word out. We are following the Illinois Department of Public Health guidelines and we will be restricting our attendance to 25 people per service. We are offering a service a week. This week we're gathering in the building on Sunday. Next week we'll be here on a Saturday night and back and forth. And so if you've been thinking at all about gathering for worship at Trinity, please uh, go to our website, which you can get all of that information. Call us or you'll see it at the end. We'll try to get something at the end of the video for information on how to get a hold of us basically to get yourself registered because we are, we want to keep that 25 number pretty tight uh, because we want to respect the guidelines. We've been doing that since the very beginning. One of the great gifts of this church is that we, we respect our doctors and scientists and when they say we got to reduce for a while, then that's what we're going to do, even if it causes us a little bit of grief and suffering. Uh, a couple other quick announcements. Um, I announced through various means, um, an invitation into a book study to read a book called Dear Church, written by Reverend Lenny Duncan. If that's something that you are thinking about, you uh, wanting to be participate in, uh, there's a sign-up sheet for that as well. Again, go into our Trinity homepage. There's a sign-up genius button. Whatever sign-ups we've got, you will find them through that, that button, through that portal. So if you're thinking about reading that book with our small group and and honestly, if we, the, the sign-up sheet has a small number to it just to kind of contain the group, but if we have a lot of interest, I don't see why we couldn't have a couple of groups going at different times. Why not? Um, so, so sign up for that. And, and just a quick note from myself, if you, <laughs> this is how my gerbil in my brain works. If you came to me at some point and said, I would really like to be part of that book study, and I nodded my head, I might have forgotten. So just go to the sign-up sheet and make sure your name is there. I tried to write down all the names I could remember. I have a bad feeling I missed one of you, and I really apologize. Um, so just head out there or just call the office. Nancy's got the list as well. Um, deadline for that is October 16th. Uh, beyond that, uh, reminder again, um, at inviting you to bring icons, uh, images, uh, pictures, objects that reflect the people in your life whom you love, whom we continue to, to give thanks for, even though they have completed their baptismal journey here on earth. Our All Saints service will be October 31st, so that is a Saturday night this year. Um, but we will have, uh, we'll set up a display of all of your icons. Feel free to bring a name. We'd love to know who you're remembering, and we will set all that up, and that will be part of our worship service. Uh, just glancing through all my notes, the one last thing I just wanted to lift up real quick is a reminder that Be the Church this year is a little bit different. We're not doing our outdoor activities um, engaging our neighbors quite the same way that we usually do. Um, this year, the council, we decided that we still wanted to do something. We still want to be the church somehow. So we're seeking financial gifts. If you are able to, to make a financial gift, we want to we wanna buy a farm. If you've ever heard of ELCA Good Gifts, that's actually something we use in our Sunday school here every year. Um, they have an option to buy a village farm for $715. And so part of our noisy offering, part of our designated giving beyond our, our regular giving, uh, we're going to put it towards that gift. Our goal, again, is to buy a farm. So hopefully you uh, can participate in that, and we invite everybody to participate in that. Um, I also know that our council president has an announcement. Now it works. Uh, good morning. Rather than come downstairs, uh, just a real quick announcement. Um, today is Corgi Appreciation Day. And so if you take a look at the screen, Trinity's blessed to have uh, Pastor Josh, obviously. But we have four, uh, in quotation, retired uh, clergy. Um, Roger Aspen, he just joined about two or three weeks ago. Uh, Brant Clements, Ron Larson, and Frank Lay. So um, in appreciation for them today, uh, the flowers on the altar are given, and they've been instructed to take a sleeve of those with them after the service um, to show our appreciation. We've traditionally also 
took clergy appreciation day, turned it into staff appreciation day. And so again on the screen, we have uh, the eight names of people that are serving uh, Trinity, um, headed by pastor, um, Nancy, our uh, office manager, Floyd, our sexton, Karen, our parish musician, Matt, chime director, Louise and Lily do our financial recording, and Melissa's in charge of our uh, youth education. So those people should check their mailboxes. There's a card uh, thanking them uh, placed there this morning. So uh, thanks very much to our staff and to our clergy. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we're here for worship, so let us begin. Our prelude is All Glory Be to God on High. We continue our service with the order of confession and forgiveness. By God's grace, our lives are connected here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Merciful God, we have been reformed from our individual lives into your living body. We gather for worship, knowing how deeply we resist your love. We approach you today, confident that we will be affirmed, but hoping that we are not transformed. We stand before you quietly stifling your words meant to break us from our patterns, loose us from our narrow focus, and shift our gaze from ourselves toward others. We confess to you, Lord, that we do not want to change. By your steadfast love, hear our honesty and liberate us of our sin. Help us, God, to know that you bring forth life from the ground and breathe through ash and dust to break us of our destructive divisive pattern to hear you declare our forgiveness, write your word upon our hearts, that your love may never be far from our lives. Receive us, renew us, and lead us, that we may walk upright in your presence and reflect your love through every interaction and space. Amen.
God is good all the time. Let us pray. Dear God, we read the words in our Bibles, we attend to our studies and dig into the books. And often we have no idea what we are supposed to digest. And more often than we care to admit, we give up. Remind us daily that your word breathes life into clay jars. Awaken us again to your wisdom that surpasses our own. Guide us once more. Back to the pages that bear your son, our Lord, and shape our faith in the world. In your name we pray, amen. Our gospel for today comes from Matthew. We are in the 22nd chapter. Jesus responded by speaking again in parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding party for his son. He sent his servants to call those invited to the wedding party, but they didn't want to come. Again, the king sent other servants and said to them, Tell those who have been invited, look, the meal is all prepared. I've butchered the oxen and the fatted cattle. Now everything's ready. Come to the wedding party. But they paid no attention and went away, some to their fields, others to their businesses, The rest of them grabbed his servants, abused them, and killed them. The king was angry. He sent his soldiers to destroy those murderers and set their city on fire. Then the king said to his servants, The wedding party is prepared, but those who were invited weren't worthy. Therefore, go to the roads on the edge of town and invite everyone you find to the wedding party. Then those servants went to the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. The wedding party was full of guests. Now when the king came in and saw the guests, he spotted a man who wasn't wearing wedding clothes. He said to the man, Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? But the man was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, Tie his hands and feet and throw him into the farthest darkness. People there will be weeping and grinding their teeth. Many people are invited, but few people are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I have a quick suggestion about this gospel before we step into it. Don't share this with your friends. This particular gospel, you know, your friends who are struggling and they're they're really down on their luck and they know that you are part of a faith community and and maybe you seem to have some sort of resolve. They keep leaning on you and, and maybe even they've come to you and said, So what keeps you going? What part of your relationship with God, what story can you tell? Don't give them this one. Not this text. This text is a hot mess. This is a parable from Jesus. And we know every time we open the Bible, we're supposed to be looking for conviction and gospel. So we're supposed to be looking for something that maybe is calling us out, calling us out of our sin, but also maybe calling us in to relationship with God. Conviction and gospel, or law and gospel. That's how we, at least in this house as Lutherans, that's how we're called to read the text. But I'm not sure exactly where it is in this story, at least not on first glance, and maybe you're not sure either. This is kind of one of those things where you crack open the Bible and you hop right in, and we innocently jump to verse 1 of chapter 22, and we're thinking to ourselves, all right, a parable parables from Jesus are fun. They're they're like puzzles that you can put together like a Rubik's Cube. And it starts out really lovely. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding party for his son. It doesn't matter what Jesus meant in our minds. We can't help it. We're going to start thinking that the king must be God and the son is The son, it must be Jesus. So we have God and we have son, and the God and the son are planning a wedding party for apparently Jesus. All right, so we have that in our mind. So we can't help it that we're going to jump into this text, and right away we're thinking that way. And as we hear in this story, the king, who of course we're thinking is God, is going to send out his servants to invite people to a wedding party, to a feast something joyous and fun with music and streamers and and maybe a band in the back and and those really cool light things that you that you ignite and you send up into the air at night and it's going to be a blast everybody come and the king sends out all of his rsvps and 
He gets zero back. All right, that's fine. So we're going to try this again. We're going to send out the servants again. Now we've got better calligraphy. We've got those really hard stock cards. We've even got the address for the castle down at the bottom in Google Maps. It's going to be super easy. Oh, by the way, tell them this. They can't wait to hear this. I've slaughtered all the oxen and the fatted cattle, so if they want steak, I've got steak. If they want brisket, I've got brisket. If they're just a ground beef person, taco bar against the whole back wall. Whatever they want, it's all here. Just just come to the party, whatever you need. And the story tells us that the servants went out and they shared this good news. And again, no RSVPs. And then in verse 6, it says, The rest of them, the people who were invited, grabbed his servants, abused them, and killed them. Which is a bit of a turn. All you got to do is just say no. This is a little violent. But it gets worse. We get to verse 7. The king was angry, justifiably so. He sent his soldiers to destroy those murderers and set their city on fire. All of a sudden, a parable from Jesus is becoming an episode of Game of Thrones. Because while the steak is cooling on the table, the king is arming his soldiers and getting his horses and getting his chariots and getting his trebuchets and whatever he needs, and he's heading out, and he obliterates the whole town. What do we do with this? How is this good news? What is this supposed to tell us about the kingdom of heaven? These are fair questions to be asking of a text like this. What is Jesus trying to tell us in this story? Then the king says to his servants, the ones who didn't get killed off the first time, he says to them, well, the first people were not worthy, clearly because there's still clouds of smoke billowing into the upper atmosphere from the city burning outside his castle. All right, now I want to send you to the outskirts of town, and I want you to invite everybody. And so we're thinking to ourselves, all right, so the first part of this story, a little weird, a little off-putting, but now it's starting to sound like Jesus. Now we're going to get down to it. We are inviting the people who are living on the outside of town, the people on the other side of the tracks, the people who are, who are struggling in life because of the color of their skin or because of their nationality or because of the clothes they wear or because of, of who they love or, or people who are longing for justice and peace and compassion, forgiveness. You know all the words that we apply to Jesus Now we get to see the kingdom of heaven in all of its beautiful cultural and and individual diversity. All these people are going to come flooding in. Everybody's now welcome to the feast, welcome to the table. And the story continues. Everybody's there with the streamers and the band in the back. And some people are are filling up their plates with tacos. And some people are enjoying the steaks with the, the garlic and the butter and all of that loveliness. And some people got the brisket that's been smoking all day. This is a feast. People are having fun. And then the king shows up. This is the part in the episode where we start hearing the, the music turn. Something's about to go down. We don't know quite what yet, but the king singles out someone who's at the party and walks over to him and throws his arm around him, casual as anything, and says, Friend, how'd you get in here without wedding clothes? As if people who are just invited to a party and just told to show up are able to somehow get to Kohl's or Walmart or Ann Taylor or wherever they're going to get their outfit and get suited up before they show up. But this guy has no response. So the king says to the servants, you know, the ones who invited all these people, tie his hands and feet and throw him into the farthest darkness. People there will be weeping and grinding their teeth. Many people are invited, but few people are chosen. Oh, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We didn't realize when we came to worship this morning that it turns out the kingdom of heaven is actually more like the Marine Corps or the Navy SEALs, and we got to grind ourselves to a point where we can become acceptable to God. At least that's how this reads on first glance. So what do we do when we come to a text? When we open up the Bible and we come to a story like this, and we don't know what to do with it because this doesn't sound like the God we learned in Sunday school. This doesn't sound like the church that we grew up in. This doesn't sound like good news. We can find all the conviction we need, but where's the grace? Where's the forgiveness? Where's the love? 
So I have a, a quick suggestion. When we come to a psalm, when we come to a story in the Hebrew writings, a story in the Christian writings, and we're looking for that conviction and that good news, when we're looking for the calling out and the calling in, sometimes it's blatant and obvious, and sometimes it's more like a sliver. It's more like a tiny little nugget, and we have to actually mine it out of the depths. So I want to invite us when we come to this text, as we pan out the gold, what tiny little nugget we might get from this. One little nugget I was able to find that I share with you, and maybe you can find others, is that three times the king, and in our minds we can't help it, the king is God. Whether or not Jesus meant that or not, we don't know because we're not there. But three times the king in this text invites people to the party. Three times God invites us into relationship with God. Three times God does what God can do to let us know that the feast is available and all we need to do is show up. And we are the ones who will find ourselves too busy. We'll be too busy to pray. We'll find ourselves too preoccupied with whatever's in front of us that We won't even realize that God is with us. We will find ourselves quieting our words when God's word is needed in a particular conversation or moment. We are the ones who will figure out whatever we need to do to keep distance between ourselves and God. And then God invites us again. And when we turn down God, God invites us again. And God keeps Inviting us back into relationship, back into community, back into the peace that surpasses all understanding, back into the work of speaking and serving justice for our neighbors. Now what do we do with all this language of destruction that's happening in this story? I'm not sure what we do with all of that. A little bit of context, which might help and might not, is that we are in chapter 22, and this is the third parable that Jesus has shared with the chief priests and Pharisees and a variety of other religious and political leaders. He's standing basically around the temple. And for those of us who even vaguely know the Gospels well enough that we know that towards the very end of all four Gospels is when Jesus dies on the cross. We're in chapter 22. There can't be that many chapters left. In fact, it's chapter 26 in the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus finally is arrested. So it's right on the horizon. He's talking to people who are trying to arrest him. And four chapters later, he will be arrested and put on trial and placed on the cross. So maybe something in, this, in these words of destruction is, is a word about the cross and about the cost of what it means to follow Christ and to receive that invitation and to continue to walk with God. We know that in our baptismal language here in this church, we talk about how we die and rise to Christ through those waters or the waters outside or the waters that we were bathed in or the waters that we take a shower in or wash our hands in. We remind ourselves that every single day. Our old selves die, our new selves rise to Christ. It happens every day. So we suffer death and life. Because Christ suffers through our suffering, through our brokenness. He walks with us and he becomes us and he does this so that we can live. So that we can be transformed, so that we can be reformed from our shattered remnants and our burnt bridges and the smoke that we have created billowing in the upper atmosphere. So that we can remember again, we bear God's image. So that we, in turn, can keep inviting. So God grabs our attention. And God reminds us once more that we are loved and we're forgiven. And we are called to forgive and to love because our faith, this feast, whether we're in this building or we're in our homes at this time, this feast is for us. And it's not just for us. It is for our neighbors. It's for all of our neighbors. Those who have been silenced, those who have been ghosted, those who have been shut down, those who have been burnt down, all of us are invited to the feast. God keeps inviting, so we keep inviting. And God keeps loving, and God keeps forgiving, and God keeps reaching into our lives to draw us back through the cross to remember again how we are so dearly loved and transformed so that we can reach out and we can love. 
and we can share God's compassion, and we can speak God's word, and we can welcome our neighbors to the joyous feast. Amen. Friends, as we continue to reflect on these words that God has given us through Scripture, I invite you to rise as you are able. On behalf of creation, our community, those of us who are gathered in this space, and those of us who gather in our homes, we offer our prayers to God. Let us pray. God, we pray for troubled hearts and troubled minds. We pray for each other who are frazzled by the endless details and the constant need for attention. Steady our thoughts and assure us of your presence as we attempt to persevere. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for our elected officials to offer words of consolation and calm. We long for less speaking and greater listening to the needs and cries of the people. We hope for political opponents to strive together for the building up of our suffering ones. Lord, we pray for this body of Christ and for every faith community that's gathering online or in spaces that we can be nourished with wisdom and care. Guide us to our phones and to the doorsteps of our neighbors who are in need of support. Open our thoughts to remember the faces and the families whom we have not seen in a while, that we might reach out and offer a loving word. Lord, this weekend we pray for presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton of the ELCA, Northern Illinois Synod Bishop Jeff Clements, the pastored, rostered leaders and lay leaders who dedicate their work to sharing faith, speaking justice, and offering Christ's compassion. In compassionate, Lord, we pray for our people who are stricken with illness, with fear, with a lack of resources, and we offer those names and those prayers to you now. God of steadfast love, we give you thanks for hearing our words and knowing our thoughts. Place these prayers alongside the prayers of the silence, the ignored, and all who have been declared unworthy or less than. Trusting that you are listening, we close these prayers as together we say, Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please wave to your neighbors. We give thanks for God's generosity in our lives. Together we pray. Generous Lord, we are grateful for all that we have been given and graciously return it to your hand. Receive this offering and send it back into the world for the healing of our neighbors. As you restore us to life through the body and blood of Christ, make us messengers of your peace. Nourish us for the journey that lays ahead and prepare us for this gift of life that we are about to receive. In your name we pray. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Confident that our Lord is at work in this meal, we offer the prayer that he first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are invited to continue on with our communion. Just a reminder again that there is a light cellophane layer covering the wafer and a heavier layer uh, protecting the juice. The body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. As we head out, let us pray. Hold us fast to your promise when we are far from this space. Speak your words of justice and mercy in our ears. Turn our hands and hearts toward any who are suffering along the journey by your life. Restore our lives and send us out transformed. In your name we pray, amen. People of God, hear God's promise for your lives once again. You are forgiven. You are renewed. You are being reformed each day in God's image. Head out hoping to engage your neighbors. May you speak peace and life for people who are longing for community. Be blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit this day and every day, wherever you may go. Amen. Go in peace. God goes with you. Thanks be to God. Thank you.